Hi, everyone, and thank you so much. Uh, yeah, well, I'm here to present this topic together with Victor Estalmuñoz and Professor Marino Perez, and thanks to the Keisha Foundation. And yeah, as you said, uh, this is kind of a philosophical topic that happens to be essential to neuroscience. So it's good that we reflect on this, right? Oh, so let's see. OK. Um, first of all, why should we even care about this topic, right? Why should uh, us as neuroscientists wonder about this philosophical question? Well, according to the guidelines of the Brain Project, it is no an exaggeration to say that nothing in neuroscience makes sense except in the light of behavior. So that means that mm, neuroscientists care not only about the brain, but also about behavior. So that's good. it's good that we reflect on the kind of relationship that exists between these two entities. And especially because sometimes we assume that the brain, that this kind of relationship is causal. So that means that the brain causes behavior, right? Examples of this are, for instance, the brain project again. Uh, one of their objectives is actually demonstrating causality, meaning linking brain activity to behavior in a causal way, right? But there are also other kind of studies as the ones that I called like the racist brain or the female brain. And these studies go like, they find a kind of a behavior that they call racist or female, whatever that is. And then they trace it to uh, find the kind of brain activity or brain structure that is causing that behavior, right? So it's good that we reflect on if it's actually the case, right? So first of all, let's define behavior and cause. So this slide is just to say that with behavior, we we mean not only the externally observable actions, but also the internal cognitive processes, such as uh, perception, memory, learning, or and so on. And this is actually in line with behavior analysis, which is the framework from which we work. From this perspective, behavior behavior is understood as the interaction between the organism and the context in which this person is embedded, right? And what is cause? Well, this has been a really long debate in philosophy for like centuries. Uh, so this could be a, a, a summary of it, which is that we understand A as the cause of B if whenever A, then B, right? So translating that into the lab, basically this means that in order to talk about cause when we are in a lab, and in order to say that A is actually the cause of B, we need to be able to manipulate A to randomize it, to find a relationship between A and B, and to have a temporal precedence of A over B, right? Seeing this with an example, because it's quite, it's easier, right? Uh, when can we say that a treatment or a pill is able to kill a bacteria, for instance, right? To, to find a treatment. Well, in order to be able to prove that in science, what we do is we create two groups, right? We give the treatment to one of the groups, and we don't give the treatment to the other group. That means that we are able to manipulate A and to randomize it because we assigned these uh, subjects randomly to each group. And then after a time, we find a correlation in the sense that we don't find the bacteria in this group anymore, but we do find it in here. So when this happens, uh, we can say that this was the cause of this phenomenon, right? So next point is that Actually, what happens in neuroscience, well, if that was the case, applying the same logic, this is what we should find or what we should be doing, which is we should have like two groups of people. Uh, we should be able to manipulate like brain activity and cause like uh, brain activity in one of the groups in a way that then in that group will find the behavior that we are like studying, for instance, a racist behavior, and we won't be finding this racist behavior in the other group. That's like following the same logic that we do, that we apply in science, right? And I think that we can all agree that this is really not what we do, because normally what we do is more similar to this. So I took the example of the racist brain. And basically, the logic that, it, that these studies follow are similar in both cases, in the structural studies and in functional studies. The idea is that what they do is that they take a racist trait, what they call it, and they uh, measure it in people. Uh, through questionnaires. So they take uh, people with low level of this racist trait and people with high level of racist trait. So that's how they create the two groups. And after that, they measure their brains. They find differences, and that's the crucial point because they then place these differences on the top 
and they say, oh, actually there are people that have something that is a racist brain, and that's what it's provoking this racist trait that then we are able to observe, right? The same logic is what happens in functional studies, but with different uh, techniques and slightly different uh, paradigms, right? But the logic is kind of the same. And as we can see in here, this is quite distinct from the requirements that allow to talk about a cause. So, uh, in to end, what shall we do with this? Uh, first of all, be cautious when doing causal attributions uh, because of the methodological limitations that I just mentioned. And this means being cautious not only when writing papers, because I feel that in, when writing papers, we are always super cautious and we try not to say like cause and we use words like mediate or things like that, right? But still, we need to be cautious also when interpreting the papers of other people or when even like interpreting them by our own, like saying, okay, what did I actually discover in here, right? Uh, this because of methodologic, because of methodologic, methodological limitations, but there's also, there are also theoretical issues in here because, and this is important, and we can discuss this in later or in the poster session, because the brain activity that correlates with the observed behavior is in fact a description at the biological level. So what we are actually finding is the same behavior, but that just in a biological level, right? Not the cause. Because the cause of behavior is actually the learning process and the learning history of the organism. But of course, we can discuss that later. So just as a conclusion of this talk, uh, except from specific circumstances, it's better to understand the brain as a as not as the cause, but rather as the phenomenon that enables behavior. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm willing to take any question that you might have.